created, and I put, and I put my sort of clinical form into your course notes, on patients that I see, regardless of why they came to see me, at a certain point, I'm going to do a cardiovascular screening assessment. I'm going to gather information on them to see what their, what their risk happens to be right now, so I'll know how I want to modify their risk of vascular disease. So what I'm looking for here, of course, the patient's name, the assessment date, are they a male or a female? Because men have more vascular disease than women. So just being a man increases your risk. What is your age? As you get older, the risk of vascular disease also increases. What's your systolic blood pressure? What's your diastolic blood pressure? Is the person a diabetic? Diabetics have a greater risk for vascular disease. And if they are a diabetic, are they insulin dependent or non-insulin dependent? Do they smoke? No, they don't. If they do smoke, I want to know how many cigarettes a day are you smoking? So I'm going to record that on my form. What is their total cholesterol? Right, I want it to be below 3.9, as I told you before. Uh, what I'm showing you here is how to convert cholesterol uh, from milligrams per deciliter into millimoles. Uh, what's the LDL cholesterol? What's the HDL cholesterol? What's the total cholesterol to HDL ratio? What's the fasting glucose? What's their fasting triglycerides? Uh, what's the C-reactive protein? So let's stop there for a second because we're going to see this again in inflammatory diseases. In the blood vessel wall where the atherosclerotic plaque is building up, there are immune cells called macrophages there that are eating up all the cholesterol. The macrophages produce inflammatory cytokines those inflammatory cytokines go to the liver and encourage the liver to produce and secrete uh, a protein known as C-reactive protein. The higher the C-reactive protein level, the more inflammation the person has in their body. If they don't have rheumatoid arthritis or, for, or they don't have any other inflammatory disease or an infection, then that inflammation is coming from the blood vessel wall. And so high C-reactive protein is related to an increased risk a vascular disease. I want to get the C-reactive protein levels down. We'll talk about how to do that later. And fibrinogen. The more fibrinogen in the bloodstream, the more uh, fibrinogen becomes converted to fibrin and it, and it acts like a string that attaches to the platelets and it forms thrombus or small clots in the blood vessel wall. Clots in the blood vessel wall are not a good thing. So high levels of fibrin are linked to, fibrinogen are linked to an increased risk of vascular disease. One of the ways that hormone replacement therapy in women increases their risk of having a heart attack or a stroke is by increasing the release of fibrinogen from the liver. Your blood levels are higher, higher. The platelets clump together in an abnormal way. There's a higher risk of vascular disease. What's their body mass index? Their weight over their height squared. Their weight is in kilograms. Their height is in meters squared. I show you how to do it here. I'll show you the exact form. And once the person has the body mass index above 27, then their risk of having uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, dyslipidemia, and certain cancers increases significantly. I want to see a body mass index definitely below 27. And I want a waist circumference. Abdominal obesity is measured easily. If it's a man and their waist circumference is above 36 inches, that spells trouble. For women, the waist circumference most ideally is below 33 inches. Do they have a personal history of any vascular problem or any procedure related to the vascular uh, system? Have they had a heart attack, a stroke, a deep vein thrombosis, any chronic renal failure? So is there kidney disease as well? Have they had angioplasty or bypass surgery or, or a coronary stent put in? If they say yes to any of those things, they're already in a super high risk category. I need to get their cholesterol below 3.9, the LDL below 1.8, the triglycerides below 1.5, the glucose below 5. What exercise program are they on? What is their kidney function look like? I can, you, can, you, know, you learned about kidney function. If the kidneys are already showing that they're shutting down, then you can't afford to clog those vessels up or this person's going to need a kidney transplant down the road. So you can't be clogging up the kidney vascular system with cholesterol and plaque. So they have to be in a really safe range. How do you know if there's kidney problems already starting? If the estimated glomerular filtration rate, rate is below 60 uh, milliliters per minute, they're already in early stage renal failure. The other way that you know if there's kidney problems is what is the blood creatinine level? So let's be, let's be clear on what this is. Because you know if you, you can buy supplements of creatine, isn't that correct? So there's creatine and then there's creatinine. They're different. Creatine is in the muscle. Your body makes creatine as well. 
And creatine works up as a, as a sort of a, a backup a high phosphagen energy system so the muscle can perform all out explosive power. It's, it's part of the energy system in the muscle cell. Creatinine is something different. Each day your body breaks down a predictable amount of muscle protein just in its normal turnover uh, uh, function. And one of the end products of muscle breakdown in your body is creatinine. And then creatinine gets into the bloodstream and the kidneys filter the creatinine and it goes into the urine. If creatinine is building up in the bloodstream, it means the kidneys are not able to filter it. You have a kidney problem. So blood creatinine levels is one of the best uh, indicators of kidney function. And nephrologists use blood creatinine on a regular basis to determine is kidney, are kidney problems progressing or do, have I stabilized them. So knowing the blood creatinine level, is it in the ideal range, tells you if there's, if there's a hint of kidney problems that would be saying, oh my God, I need to be more aggressive in this person to get their lipid levels even lower. And then in the urine, you can measure a thing called the albumin to creatinine ratio. An elevated ratio indicates that there's kidney problems in behind the scenes. So knowing kidney function is important in the cardiovascular uh, overall assessment. And then <clears throat> does the patient have metabolic syndrome? Do they have uh, any of these, do they have three or more of any of these criteria? Do they have a, an increased waist circumference uh, for a man above 40 inches, for a woman about 35 inches? You say, oh yes, they do, okay. Do they have triglycerides above 1.7? I told you below 1.5 is ideal. Above 1.7, you go, oh, that's not good. Yes, they have that. Do they have an HDL that's really low for a man below 1, for a woman below 1.3? Oh, yes, they have that. Do they have blood pressure problems over 130, over 85? Oh, they have that. Do they have a glucose level between 5.7 and 6.9? They're not a diabetic yet, but they've got dysglycemia. So if they have um, three or more of those inclusion criteria, they have metabolic syndrome. They're on their way to being a diabetic. They're on their way to vascular disease and possibly even certain types of cancer that are linked to this. So do they have evidence of what's called metabolic syndrome? And then what is the 10-year risk of them having a heart attack based on the Framingham Heart Study criteria, which I'm about to show you? When you see blood work, you ask the patient to bring you their latest blood work. What you'll see on the form is it'll always say, Based on the Framingham heart study, the person who's in the following risk categories, uh, these should be the target lipid levels. And then it'll say very high risk, high risk, medium risk, low risk. And you'll say, what does this mean? And it shows the doctor if the person meets a certain standard that this should be the target, this should be the level they want to try to get their cholesterol down to. And I want to show you where this came from. So the Framingham Heart Study is the longest standing heart study ever done on humans. It started back in the 50s in Framingham, Massachusetts. And it's been following thousands of people since the 1950s. And they're looking to see who develops heart disease and stroke and who doesn't. And what they've been able to show is that with a certain scoring system, they can decide over the next 10 years what your risk is of having a heart attack. Is it 3%? Is it 16%? Is it 28%? The Framingham study, the way it relates to medicine today is done this way. That if your risk is below 10%, that's a low risk. If it's between 11 and 20%, that's medium risk. If it's above 20%, that's a high risk. So, um, the, I'm going to show you how you actually do that scoring in just a second. I also want to know, is there, um, are the, is the person on any current cardiovascular disease drugs? I want to know what drug, are they on statin drugs, are they on phenofibrate, are they on antihypertensive drugs, are they on anticoagulant drugs? So I want to put that on my form as well. So what you're seeing, and I put these, I put these original forms in your note service package so you can use them with your own patients over the years. But you'll what the forms show, so here we have the, uh, a form for men looking at, this is known as the LDL cholesterol form because 
it looks at the person's age, their LDL cholesterol, their HDL cholesterol, their blood pressure, are they a diabetic, are they a smoker? And then there's a, there's a, there's a number of points that are awarded based on the scores that you have. And so you add up those points and then you put them here, the age point, LDL, HDL, um, the uh, HDL, blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, and you add all the points up. And then you go down the list, you see how many points they scored, and it tells you here exactly what the person's risk of having a heart attack is over the next 10 years. So there's a, there's a form that uses the LDL, there's another form that uses the total cholesterol for men, then there's also the, the form for women, there's the one with the LDL for women, and then there's one with the LDL uh, for, or the total cholesterol for women as well. So I gave you all four of those forms. So if the, the person's risk of having a heart attack over the next 10 years from the Framingham scoring form that I'm just showing you is less than 10%, most doctors won't get that excited. Regardless of what the person's cholesterol is or what their triglycerides are, or what, they really won't even pay that much attention to it because they're saying this person's in a pretty low risk anyway. If it's in the medium risk range, then they might start to introduce some medications to bring the lipid levels down. If it's above 20%, they're a very high risk and they'll be much more aggressive. They'll always be super aggressive if the person's already had a heart attack or has kidney problems or uh, has had a cardiovascular uh, intervention like angioplasty, coronary bypass surgery, or they have a stent put in to one of their vessels. So my screening form sort of takes all of this into account, as you can see, and I put this in your note service package. It shows you what my overall screening is with a new patient that I like to see. Now, if you're a chiropractor, you're not going to see this on visit one. You're going to work with the patient the way a chiropractor would. You can do the orthopedic exam, the neurological exam. You're going to solve their musculoskeletal problem. When the patient just finally has confidence in you after a number of visits and you solve the chief complaint, and then you want to entertain having a discussion with them about proactive lifestyle strategies to enhance their overall level of wellness, over and above knowing what they eat and how much they exercise and what their weight is, and their body and their, their uh, circumference of their, of their stomach. It's nice to get some blood values. So what I usually do is give them my screening form and say, I'd love you to go back to your doctor. And maybe you've already had these blood tests done. And if you have, then just get me a photocopy and bring them to me. If you haven't, this is the overall screening that I like to see on every patient. So I can give you really evidence-based information about lifestyle issues around diet, supplementation, and exercise patient goes, wow, that's, I really appreciate you doing that. So this is the form, yeah, this is the form, this is my initial screening form. So just so you see what it is, because I've included it in your note service, so you can use it as well. As you see, you know, blood pressure, pulse, diabetes, total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, total cholesterol, HDL ratio, which I, I'm going to calculate that. Once I know their total cholesterol and HDL, I can figure out the ratio. I want it to be under 3.1. What's the uh, fasting glucose, fasting triglycerides, C-reactive protein, fibrinogen? What's the INR? The INR is the International Normalized Ratio. It tells me how sticky is their blood. So it used to be called the prothrombin time. You know, you prick the person's finger, how long did they bleed for? Now it's called the INR. They use a reagent. They can tell what the blood stickiness is. There's certain values there. When we talk about anticoagulants, we'll come back to that. What's the estimated glomerular filtration rate, looking at kidney problems? What's the blood creatinine level? What's the homocysteine level? As homocysteine builds up in the bloodstream, there's an increased risk of vascular disease. Homocysteine builds up when B vitamin levels are too low because you need folic acid, vitamin B12, and vitamin B6 to recycle homocysteine back to methionine. So if homocysteine's high, I know they need more B vitamins. Homocysteine damages the blood vessel wall, increases the risk of vascular disease. What's the fructosamine level? The best long-term indicator of a person's uh, glycemic status, your status included, knowing your fasting blood glucose is one thing, but to look for the sugar-coated proteins in your bloodstream that have been building up over a long period of time, that's fructosamine. If I can get a fructosamine level, it'll tell me, hey, do you have glucose irregularities where you're sugar-coating your proteins over a long period of time and they're starting to clog up the small blood vessels and produce inflammation, 
fructosamine level is a very strong determinant of how long a person's going to live and what their risk of vascular disease is. So in, if you have a life insurance policy that goes above, say, a million dollars, then usually the life insurance company will insist, as you, every time you have a, uh, a, an annual ex physical exam, they want to know your fructosamine levels. If your fructosamine levels go too high, they cancel the policy because you're at high risk for premature death. You're sugarcoating your, your proteins way too fast. What's the uric acid level? Uric acid makes the blood very, very sticky, uh, increasing platelet, uh, coagulate, or platelet uh, uh, adhesion. And it also inhibits the normal release of nitric oxide so the blood vessels can't dilate normally, raising blood pressure. So the uric acid not only increases the risk of gout, and we'll talk a lot about gout, but uric acid has these negative effects on the vascular system. And then I like to know the sodium, potassium, chloride, and calcium blood levels and look at uh, these uh, different electrolytes. Do they have metabolic syndrome, yes or no? Here's the inclusion criteria. We've already seen it. And what's the 10-year risk of uh, having a heart attack based on the Framingham score sheets that I showed you? So I will do that work myself. And then, of course, the CBC. What's the hemoglobin, the hematocrit? What's the red blood cell count? What's the white, white blood cell count? What's the white blood cell differential? So you know, we'll revisit some of this when we talk about some of the other diseases. We'll get into what white blood cells do in particular instances and, and why that's so important. What's the serum iron level? If iron levels drop down, I know this person's going to be fatigued. They might develop anemia. Their immune system's not going to work that well. They might feel depression. So I need to know serum ferritin, because low serum ferritin is a very common finding uh, in women today. And vitamin B12, what's that level? Uh, what does that look like? Is it in the ideal range for prevention of cancer and making normal red blood cells? The vitamin D level as a, as a marker for osteoporosis, multiple sclerosis, and also cancer risk. The total bilirubin tells me something about liver function to some degree. The blood urea and nitrogen tells me something about uh, kidney function. The total albumin, the total protein in the bloodstream. These, are three, these two liver tests are very important the GGT and the ALT. So if, if, you're, if, there's no, if you don't think the person has any liver disease, you might just, in your general screening, you would do the GGC and the ALT. The GGT, if the person's using a lot of alcohol behind, they're sort of a, a chronic functioning alcoholic. They drink alcohol almost every day, but they seem to be able to function. Uh, very often, you'll see a rise in the GGT which will tell you, mm, I was right, they, they are, they are ca having enough alcohol to cause liver damage. And the ALT will, <laughs> excuse me, excuse me the, the ALT will often rise if the person's using Tylenol on a, a level, on a regular frequent, or on a frequent basis, starting to cause liver damage, the ALT will rise. If they're on statin drugs, you might see a rise in these uh, enzymes in the blood because liver cells are being damaged, as well as creatine kinase, which we talked about earlier. And because hepatitis C can be spread so easily, uh, even through you know, sexual contact, uh, blood to, any kind of blood-to-blood -blood transmission, you, know, you can have completely benign hepatitis C without any symptoms. I'd like to, to screen for that just to see, because if there is hepatitis C, there are certain nutrients that can help to protect the liver before any extensive damage uh, moves forward. I like to know the TSH level, the thyroid stimulating hormone, the, the free T3 and the free T4. These are the forms of thyroid hormone in the bloodstream. We'll talk more about this at a later date. And then in terms of other hormones, the DHEA level, the cortisol level. If cortisol level is really high and DHEA is low, I know they're being affected by stress. The person says, oh no, uh, stress isn't a factor with me. And then I say, cortisol's up here and DHEA is way down. Oh yes, it is. So I have some objective uh, evidence. What's the estrogen level, the progesterone level, looking for imbalances, the testosterone level, and insulin-like growth factor one. Knowing that as people get older, all of these hormones tend to drop down and can have effects on the person's, how they feel and their level of function. What can I be doing through in natural ways to compensate for the loss of those hormones to keep them strong and fit and having energy? What can I do to support thyroid function? How can I keep the IGF-1 levels elevated through exercise and protein intake. So my brain is always thinking, how do I optimize this clinical picture? What's their body mass index? What's the waist circumference? And I would do a standard urinalysis, as most doctors would do. And if there's any hint of kidney damage, then of course, doing the albumin to creatinine ratio makes sense to, because it gives you a, an, ind an index of uh, 
kidney uh, function and, uh, risk and uh, level of impairment. So there's, with respect to vascular disease, over and above cholesterol and high blood pressure and triglycerides, you know, it's, it's a multifaceted risk thing that you want to try to assess from one individual to the next. Everything from smoking right through to lack of exercise and obesity. A lot of people in our society have these compound risk factors and that's why vascular disease is so prevalent. And so lifestyle modification by you can actually make a huge difference in your patient's lives. I mean, decreasing the person's risk so that the, the father of three children doesn't die prematurely at, at age 55 or 56 is really it's an important thing for you to you know, look at. Every time you meet a human being, you say, what is this person's risk factor? And if I had that blood work in front of me, I could, you know, I could really fine tune it. So I have that screening for I say, I would love for your doctor to give me these tests. And the doctor goes, well, I, I, I normally do these things anyway. There's a few things I don't do all the time, but if you really want them, okay, we'll do them. Sometimes like fructosamine, homocysteine, vitamin D, uh, the patient has to pay for it. You know, it's not free. And they go, and I said, listen, it's worth paying for that, even just once, just so we get a, a baseline. And they go, okay, doc, so it might cost me 100 bucks, but you know, at least I got, it, I got it done. So not everything's all covered, but most of the things I showed you here are actually covered by most healthcare plans. So I'll, I'll just show you one patient I had. Um, this was about two years ago. Just as, just as an example, I've had many patients like this. A guy who's been overweight his whole life. From the time he was you know, in the schoolyard, teased throughout life, he was always overweight and out of shape. And he went on all kinds of wild weight reduction programs with different doctors and cabbage soup and this thing and fit for life. And then he went to that one. And he, he, you know, and he lost weight, gained weight, lost weight, gained weight. But he was always going on a program, going off a program. So when, I, when he came to see me, I, I didn't put him on a diet. I put him on a lifestyle program. I said, let's take a look at who you are. Bring me your blood work. Looked at his blood work. Uh, and did my standard assessment stuff, and I said, listen, what we ha and I looked at his diet, I said, okay, let's, we need to get the animal fats out, we need to improve the types of carbs that you're eating, I don't want you to starve to death, and I need you to, to exercise a little bit more, and let's, let's get you into the groove, I should explain how endurance exercise works to burn fat and build cardiovascular health. Anyway, look at this guy, he starts off, this is just in three to four months, he's 210 pounds, he goes to 184, he loses 26 pounds, that was in the first three months, actually. His waist goes from 45 inches down to 41.5. His hip goes from 45 to 41.5. His total cholesterol goes from 4.65 down to 4.0. He's almost under 3.9 now, right? I want him under 3.9. He's almost there. Just in three, the blood tests were done just three months later. The LDL goes from 3.11, which I don't want, down to 2.5, which is actually acceptable. I would like it to go lower, but this is only in the first three months. His HDL goes up from 1.06, which for a man is not good, up closer to what is considered to be ideal. And his total cholesterol to HDL ratio goes from a high ratio to what, is, what you want is a three to one ratio or less. So within three months, he's almost at the ideal ratio. No drugs, and he wasn't on a diet. I just simply gave him, took the fats out of the diet, gave him more fiber and some ground flaxseed. He used his elliptical machine at home. He started 20 minutes a day. He worked up to 40 minutes five times a week while he was watching television. I put him on the Adiva multiple vitamin our nature's essential oils with boris, flaxseed, and fish oil. I gave him cardio essentials, which has the CoQ10 and Hawthorne, because he's older, he's, his body's not making as much CoQ10 as he gets older. And because he's a man over the age of 40, I had him on prostate 40 plus to protect his prostate gland. And, uh, you know, in three to four months, he's got a lifestyle program, and he's in love with it. And he just kept going and going and going. He's like, this is, this is the new me. This is who I've become. I've become someone new in the process. So, it, you know, you, you can transform people's lives. And the guy says, you know, I've never, I never believed in my whole life I could ever look like this and feel this good. Because no one ever showed him how to do it in a rational, sane way. The last thing on vascular disease, as far as this component goes, is the thing called endothelial function. So, you know, magically, the tissues in the body know how much oxygen they need at any given time. So it's not like all the blood vessels in the body are wide open every second. Otherwise, you know, you would collapse because there'd be, you wouldn't have enough blood to get to your brain. So, so the endothelial cells secrete nitric oxide, which will 
indirectly dilate blood vessels based on how much oxygen is needed in that area at any given time. That's known as normal endothelial function. You can have endothelial dysfunction where that doesn't happen and the, and the blood vessels remain constricted. And that can lead to uh, angina and coronary events and decrease blood flow to the kidneys and, and ensuing uh, uh, kidney disease. And the things that cause endothelial function are a high saturated fat diet and high LDL cholesterol. Cigarette smoking also increases endothelial dis These are great exam questions, endothelial dysfunction. High blood pressure increases endothelial dysfunction, adds to the problem. Being a diabetic, diabetics have more endothelial dysfunction. They can't secrete the amount of nitric oxide necessary to dilate those vessels at the appropriate time. Things that have been shown to reverse endothelial dysfunction, which are helpful, folic acid, the B vitamin, antioxidant supplements, vitamin C, vitamin E. When you supplement with them at significant dosages, you get this effect. Aerobic exercise does that. Improving glucose tolerance through exercise and weight loss. Improve nitric oxide release, better endothelial function. The herb hawthorn increases nitric oxide release, dilating blood vessels, lowering blood pressure, improving blood flow. Coenzyme Q10 in diabetics has been shown to also have this effect, lowering blood pressure, improving endothelial function by upregulating uh, this vasodilation effect. And there's an herb called uh, Tribulus terrestris, which also has been shown uh, to do this, which is often used to help improve erectile dysfunction problems because it seems to really uh, come into play uh, with blood vessels in the genitalia. 